Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Can you all hear me? Wave at me if you can hear me. Everything's clear. David the Mustafa. Well, I thank you for the invitation this weekend. Uh, it's been a wonderful time so far. And Pastor Satish, God bless you, man. Uh, I thank God for the work that you and your team are doing uh, in the greater metro area in Dallas with Metro Church. And I, and I thank God for the vision that is birthing in your guys' hearts. Uh, I felt in my heart the last time that we, that we spoke, um, the last time that I, I was able to spend with you, that I believe that you guys are standard bearers. And that means that um, you have to kind of pioneer and step forward as almost a prototype in certain levels of advancing, you know, the, the local church, particularly the East Asian local church in the United States, just to, uh, to get out there and do what you can, knowing that others are watching. And as you begin to succeed, they're going to follow suit because people are looking for an example. And it takes, a, it takes courage, you know, to do stuff that, that, that is trend-setting and standard-bearing. Somebody's going to do it. Today, we talked about stepping up. And I believe that you as a church are doing exactly that, that you're stepping up. For those that shared, Bettina, thank you for that beautiful testimony. Absolutely, absolutely amazing. I thank God for what he's doing with you and Linson, and that he's elevating you guys and just promoting you. Always begin where you are and with what you have, right? And for Stephen and Stacey, wow, man. Wow, wow, wow. God is doing some great things. And I just... You know, for me, that's the blessing for me is when I hear these amazing testimonies of what God is doing. Then I know that our time was not futile, but our, our time was fruitful together. The last time that the church called this holy convocation, this holy get together. Again, I insist that the last time that we spoke, we said there was a song that was come, gonna come out of Metro. I'm waiting for that song to come out. You that are in the worship team, you that are musical, just, just get with the program, watch what God will do, amen. You'll never know until you take the first step in obedience, then God does the rest. So we're discussing leadership and I might do the unorthodox thing again. I know that I'm, I'm usually pressed for time, but I do wanna hear from maybe three people based on what you've learned so far this weekend. What has stuck with you? What has the Lord been saying? Can I have three people unmute themselves and just, uh, and just respond? Keep it short, amen. Who's gonna go first? I'll go. Uh, this is Steffi. Um, today morning, you had mentioned how uh, God created um, a man and he put him in Eden. And although he created it, he gave man the job to name the animals. And I liked how you said that um, God does something, but he doesn't complete it because he wants us to be part of the story and he wants us Amen. to do the partial the part of the work as well. That's it. Absolutely awesome. Thanks, for, for Steffi, for sharing that. In fact, when you read in the book of Hebrews that all these great people that we talk about in Scripture, all of them, the Bible says, did not receive the promise and, and did not receive the completion of what they were hoping for because God did not want their testimony, testimony to be complete without us. Amen. So Abraham never got to see the birth of the Christ or to experience the fullness of what was promised because God in his mind said there's a generation that is yet to come that I want to be the one that takes this entire story into the end zone. Okay, so if God did not complete what he could have completed, it's because he wanted our participation as mankind, but even our participation as a generation as well. So that's why we've got to step up, people, because that's why he says that we are surrounded with a, with a cloud of witnesses. I think it's in Hebrews chapter 11 toward the end. We're surrounded with, into chapter 12 and verse 1. We're surrounded by, with a great cloud of witnesses. Who are the witnesses? All those great saints of old are literally in the bleachers of heaven cheering us on. Because their testimony would never be complete without us. So we've got to step up. We've got, they've set such a precedent and such, such a standard. There is no way that we can underperform and somehow think that we can get away with it. It's not cool. We've got to step up and do our job. Anybody else? Thanks for sharing that, Steffi. Next person, please. Two things that, Pastor Felix, this is Josh. Uh, two things that stood out to me was uh, that when the world makes something inferior, we have no right to complain if we didn't, if we were supposed to step in in that. And the other Amen. thing was um, the bramble, the story about the bramble. Amen. Thanks, Josh, for that. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, here's the thing. You know, I heard some people complain at one time. Madonna wrote a, a, a children's book and they were complaining. And I said, where, where, where's your children's book? Where's the one you wrote? Well, apparently it wasn't there. So if the world is producing an inferior, massively uh, marketed product, and if we are not producing anything that is of any real value, we don't really have a leg to stand on. Amen. And so that, that's why I'm saying 
I'm looking for innovators. I'm praying that the Lord may raise innovators, may raise, you know, you know, worshipers, may raise men of God that can teach. And, and I'm also believing not for Christian writers, but for writers that are Christian, you know, looking for authors that are Christian. It, it, like the C.S. Lewis in the Tolkien, that, that tradition, you know, that can tell fables and stories that are loaded with, 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 with biblical themes. You know, the runaway bestseller in, 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 in fiction of late made the author a billionaire, that's uh, J.K. Rowling's with the Harry Potter series. And we have not really had a major Christian author since then. Maybe that's you. I'm just hoping that uh, can, would, I, would I write the next, you know, uh, book on, on Bible and verse? Not necessarily. There's a whole ton of those out there. I got, I got theolog theological books that are this size. But who's telling, who's telling biblical related stories in a way that is in everyday language that another person can pick on and can be blessed by? Like in the tradition of C.S. Lewis and Tolkien. Listen, man, if we're not producing that, we cannot complain when the world begins to turn out a lot of junk and that, that lot of junk is getting pop appeal or mass appeal. We got to step up and do our job. Thanks for that, Josh. I'll take one more person. Uh, anybody else? Last individual. I don't know where this fly came from. Last one. Kind of feel like uh, Vice President Pence here. Um, let's got, go. Who, who's uh, the next person? I got one. Um, this is Sunil. So you said it's not a book to be a leader, but a, a necessity. Amen. It's absolutely, absolutely essential. So here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen, which I just want to share. Thanks for that, my, my bro Sunil. Uh, and we're going to get straight to work right now. I, I feel that what you must understand about leadership is that leadership is not, is not a position. You know, it's not because you are you have a position that you're considered a leader. Some of the greatest leaders have not held any real formal position. But a leader is just the one whose influence on an organization or on a group of people or on a team it has consequential positive results for whatever task or vision is at hand. So when you look at it, David was anointed to be king in Israel when he was a teenager. So when did he become king? He became a leader almost right away, but he did not become king until you know he got into his 30s, right? And how he finally had the position was that he had to grow in the position. First of all, he had to look after sheep. After graduating from looking after sheep, he looked after 400, you know, indebted men that had despondent in despair. He turned those men into, those 400 men into mighty men. And then after that, he was given the tribe of Judah. And after six years as the king of Judah, he was then given, you know, kingship over the whole realm. But what you must understand is before he had the position, he had already the influence in Israel. So when in, in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, we see the whole David and Goliath scenario break out. Israel was, there was no leader. Saul was hiding, his men were hiding, and here comes a young man who has no position, but as a call to leadership. And he says, I will deal with this problem. Why? Because amongst other things, leaders are problem solvers. They see a problem like what Bettina was sharing, see a problem, in, see a need, meet a need. Okay, and so what does David do? He says, listen, I'll take care of this guy. Um, and he did. And in fact, there's a whole lesson in, 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 in what he did and how it could be done better. The whole Goliath thing could have been done better. But uh, and I'll explain to, uh, that someday. But the whole idea was that he was a youngster, but he stepped up. And because he stepped up, he brought a mighty, you know, uh, victory for Israel. He didn't have the position, but had the leadership. And what's also interesting to understand is that Goliath himself was not the king of the Philistines but he was the leader. How do you know that Goliath was the leader of the Philistines? Because when you strike the leader, strike the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. When Goliath fell down, so did, did the entire army of, of, of the Philistines. They all ran for their lives and were cut down. So even though he did not have kingship, he was actually the legitimate rule, you know, uh, leader. So G David and Goliath was a clash of leadership. It was a clash of headships, neither of which held position in the natural. But had the leadership ethos and the leadership anointing, the, really, the leadership call was upon their lives. And so way before the position came officially, David was already operating. Why? Because amongst other things, leaders put themselves out there to solve a problem. They don't look around to see who's going to take care of this. They say if, if there's a job to be done and somebody has to do it, it might as well be me. So again, we want, we want to talk about the power of headship and the calling of headship tonight. And I read you thanks for beautiful worship, man. And I absolutely 
if you had asked me for a selection of songs, you know, I think I would have picked that very, very um, beautiful presence of the Lord. And um, I, I want to deal with something that I began today uh, earlier, but just didn't have a chance to really explore. Um, and we're going back to the, to the notion of headship. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 28, please. And I'm only using this as a launching pad, okay, because something was mentioned there that I believe uh, you know, it's powerful. What we know in Deuteronomy chapter 28 is from verse 1 to 14, the Lord is speaking of the vision of blessing that he has for his elect or for his, um, you know, his chosen people. And so I hear a lot of people say, well, my brother, you know, why are you claiming Deuteronomy 28 verse 1 to 14? Why don't you read all the other verses about curses? It's because I'm not stupid. Why am I emphasizing on the curse when I should just, I should invest my mind on understanding how the blessing comes? Amen. It's a lesson for another day. A lot of people talk too much to the devil, man. We get into church and the first thing they begin, Satan in the name, why are you talking to him? God is right there and you still got time to have a conversation. No, or center your conversation with God, man. And when you do that, something powerful and something special happens. I cannot believe this. I'm going to go over among these things. Oh, I didn't work. Sorry about that, guys. The whole idea is this. <laughs> I, I said the Obama thing because he once clapped and he caught a fly, literally like, like, like that Kung Fu master. So the whole thing that I'm saying right now is simply this, is that when we're talking about headship here, it, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 to 14, is God's intent for his elect. Let me just share a few verses and go to my main point. He says here, now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord to observe and carefully all his commands, which I command you, today, that the Lord will set you high above all the nations. So literally he's saying that when you walk in accordance with the ordinance of God, there's an elevation that is coming. He shall set you high above the nations of the earth. So it is really the blessing of elevation or what you might call the blessing of promotion. Now, now then he says this, he begins to speak his intent. This is what they were invited to. And this is what our being engrafted into this tradition, because of our faith in Christ, we are engrafted into the same tradition as well. Look at what it says here. It says, um, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of your, the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be. And that term blessed really means empowered shall you be in the city and, and blessed shall you be in the country. Got it. Blessed shall be the fruit. It says blessing shall come upon you. Blessed shall you be in the city. Blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb. Thank God for Stacy and, 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 and Stephen, right? And the produce of your ground and the increase of your herds and the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. And I, as an African coming up, really needed to know that, there's, that the Lord wants to expand us, not only in our prayerfulness, which is what we talked about, that some of us are so amazingly spiritual and prayerful. And so we are great priests, but we are horrible kings. Because when we talk about kingship, it has got to do with how you handle business on the planet, how you handle work on the planet. What do you produce? What do you create? What do you manage? And so now the invitation here is this. The Lord wants us to be blessed in the country, out there, and also in the city. You see that there's a, a, a call into elevation. He's talking about so your basket and your kneading bowl. Bless shall you be when you come in. Bless shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause his enemy, your enemies to fall before you. They'll come at you one way, flee before you seven ways, etc. Then we get to verse 13 where I want to make my case. It says, and the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. And you shall be above only and not beneath. So again, you and I understand that this is metaphoric speaking, right? That I'm going to make you the head and not the tail. Meaning you shall be the leader and not just the follower. The Lord is enabling you to be a person that moves in a dimension of leadership. That was the call of Israel which was then realized in the church, which uh, Bettina made reference to, is that when I was teaching the last time, we talked about that, how the church, he says, uh, in, 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 I think it's in Luke chapter 16, is it or Matthew 16, on this rock, I will build my church. And the term that Christ used for that is the ecclesia. And ecclesia is not just a collection of people. No, it is the city leaders. It is the magistrates that sit at the city gate. So the minute that Christ even spoke about the church, he was really speaking about what would then become the leadership of the planet. Now, remember what I said in the beginning, even though the church may not have held natural position of leadership, that ragtag group of individuals with some of the greatest influences that this planet has ever known, 
And so within their short little lifetimes, they had infiltrated their known world with the gospel of Jesus Christ and were changing the culture until the culture of Rome, the, the, the empire that crucified Christ was bowing its knee to Christ. Something had happened, which is what? Which is that this ragtag group of individuals were the head and not the tail. The tail is just following what the empire says. The head is when, when your culture and your values begin to determine the values that others enjoy. Now notice how the early church did it. They never enforced by, by, by forceful legislation the change of heart that led to Rome coming under the ban of Christianity. They just modeled Christian behavior in such a powerful way that the Romans began to desire what they had. Something Stephen said at, at Microsoft, they love what you're doing, so they ask, how do you do it? Give you the opening to preach. Don't go there and be Bible thumping and be like that person that will go into your workplace with a megaphone and just irritating everybody thinking, well, you know, we got to preach the gospel, my brother. Listen, when you begin to model and you begin to show leadership capacity, you begin to show that you can get things done and that things change for the better under your care. They will come and they will ask you, how in the world do you do that? Then it gives you an opportunity, you know, to begin to share that. I, I have a secret. Okay, I have a secret. The, the source of my wisdom is not just the fact that I read books and I read books. I don't just read Christian books, I read books. But that's not the source of my wisdom and my understanding. My source of my wisdom, even my interest in, in the whole world of understanding and knowledge and wisdom is coming from God. I heard Dr. Miles Monroe say this before he passed away. What a lot of people don't know about Miles Monroe is that Dr. Miles Monroe was not just a preacher or the pastor of the largest church in the Bahamas. You know, Miles Monroe was uh, a consultant to about eight third world governments. He also worked with the Sony Corporation. And uh, at one particular time, he speaks of how he was in Japan speaking to the, you know, the team of leaders that were part of the Sony Corporation at that time. And they're like, listen, man, everything you're telling us, we've never heard. We've never read it in the books, in our management books. Where is it coming from? Gave him, the, he gave him an opening to introduce them to Christ, took an altar call, and a bunch of these guys got saved. My whole idea is this, why are we asking people? Look at how Jesus won the disciples. He says what? Follow me. That means that he set such an example that, that they desire to be what he was, to go where he was going, to be of the same belief system as he was. Why are we trying to invite people to something that we are modeling so incorrectly? What I mean by that is this. And I'm, I've been seeing it, listen, I've been yelling at, at some of my preacher friends here in the United States. I'm like, we are on, on, on our social media disrespecting the world, calling the, these people devils and that person devils and these people are demons and this, all this. And then at the same time, we're praying about a revival. A revival of what? How are you gonna reach people you disrespect? This nation right now is so divided, almost as divided as this nation was back in the civil war days. And the Christians are usually are really at the center of this as part of the problem. Because if we label half of this country a bunch of demons, a bunch of baby killers, and we call them that on our social media platforms, and then we say, hey, can you come to our faith? Who's going to come running to that faith? Ah, I, you know, I, a friend of mine, a lot of Hindus began to come into the neighborhood where they were. And, uh, and his beautiful wife was talking one time and she was like, oh, you know, we got all these Hindus that are moving in and, you know, they're doing all the, you know, the festival of lights, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I was trying to catch the tone like, oh, am I supposed to be upset about that? I'm sorry, because I think that's an amazing idea that you got a whole bunch of Hindus. So you don't have to go there, they're coming to you. Come on. What, but the, the whole thinking was, uh, we're getting attacked. We're getting attacked. These people are infiltrating us because the church has been, in, you know, we've had individuals sometimes that have not been leading us according to the way that Christ led. And that's why we're having this, this conference where the right people step up, please, or we will have the rule of the brand. Sinners, I want to say this outright, guys. Sinners are not our problem. They are our purpose. If there was nobody to reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ, it would have been raptured a long time ago. This whole fascination, fascination with the rapture, I had a friend of mine, and I believe in the second coming of the Lord, but look at the one who preached it more than you and I, who was Paul. He preached it more than you and I, and we take our eschatological or end time doctrine from him. But you show me where he did not, where he slowed down to be so enamored by which nation is coming against which nation and what. No, he preached it, but he went and he occupied and did more 
in the short years of his life than we have done because everybody sparked. I had a friend that bought everything that, that I think it's um, Perry Stone. He had a library and had spent almost $100,000 at that time of all these products of all Hal Lindsey and all these, you know, eschatological teachers. And I remember just thinking, my bro, you know, before Goma and Magog attack Israel, you, you may not even be here. Here you are worried about what's going to happen. And every little world event, you're wondering, I've got to go to, you know, this uh, Jonathan Khan, and I got to, maybe I'm touching on your favorite folks here. I'm just saying that where there's a fascination that takes us away from our function, because we're just waiting to see what the next bad thing that's going to happen. The, then, the, then the church is without leadership. The church I grew up in told me Christ was coming back in 2000. So imagine the kind of vision that was invested in us. We did not see anything beyond the year 2000. So guess what? 2000, you know, 1st of January, you know, 2000 happened and nothing happened. Now, all of a sudden we started scrambling to try and figure out a vision. There's a great need. What if the Lord tarries? Why is the Lord not coming right now in our time? Well, my brother, we've never been closer. Here's what I know. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us. The reason why he's waited so long is that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That means what? That means that it may not happen in your lifetime. So then what do you do? Work while it's day for night cometh where no man can work. We got work to do. How did that friend of mine die? He passed away. He had a heart attack while sitting on a commode. I don't know, eight years ago? After spending all this money, just worried about when the Lord comes, when the Lord comes, when the Lord, and, this, and that not doing anything, but just obsessed with end time events, obsessed with who's rising where, who's the leader where, what are the leader? I want to call the church back to order in this sense. We've got enough work to do. And so what is required of you and I right now is that we have to see that leaders rise up. Now we're talking about leadership and we're talking about how to be the head and not the tail. The way that I can describe this is as I did before, as we began to talk earlier, when we're looking at um, the, using headship as, as an example here. And the reason why I wanted to say this is this, is we talked about the covering, which is like the lion's mane. I'm using this purely just as an example, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, uh, so that you can understand some concepts that when you're a person that wants to lead the mane of the lion, which is the covering of the lion, which is your hair, you know, the, what it can symbolize when you're learning leadership is that which is above your head, that which covers you. Or that, so what does that mean? Spiritual authority, mentors, et cetera, et cetera. You have to find a mentor. We talked about that this morning. Who's mentoring you? Who's holding you to account? Who's making sure you do the things you said you were going to do? So it's important to have that type of covering. You honor your parents, you honor godly authority, your pastors and your leaders in your small groups. If you will have a spirit of honor in the vertical plane, you will experience the spirit of honor on the horizontal plane. So if you take care of that, those which are above you, those that are under you and those that are you know, lateral to you, they will be that overflow of blessing. That's why anybody who ever re rebelled against authority this way had those that were under them rebel against them. So that's what the, the leaders is. But the, the, one of the important things that I'd like to discuss right now is something that I'm going to call the leaders because we're looking at headship as a type to understand leadership, right? I don't want to get too preacher on and be a little bit more practical. So when we discuss headship, one of the things that we look at when we look at headship is that I want to talk about the leader's mind. And, and, and right now in this little instance, I'm gonna give you a little example here, which listen, and no, don't, 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 don't judge my skills. I wanna show you something here. When we're talking about headship in this, what I call the leader's mind. Now, by the way, that's a, that's a little picture of you. <laughs> okay, that's a, that, that's a little picture of you. And um, come on, where are we? And that's your head, that's your body. So there's, there's, there'll be limbs attached to that. The one thing that I want to make real clear so that you and I understand is that when we're looking at, at our head and we're looking at who we are as people, our thinking, how we think matters. Amen. How we think matters. So the question becomes, well, how do I think? Because the quality of our thinking is like this. When you look at scripture, here's what you're going to find out. 
that um, whether it's Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 7, as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. There's a lot of people that want to lead, but don't have quality thinking. Here's also what's important. It says, as he thinketh, but then it says, in his heart, so is he. So what does that mean, as he thinketh in his heart? As you begin to dig a little bit deeper, here's what you find. In scripture, you're going to see uh, teachings concerning body, soul, and spirit. And it comes all the way from the book of Genesis, where here's how the creation, the act of creating man happened. God created man in his own image and according to his likeness. Then he formed our body from the dust of the ground. So Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, he formed our body from the dust of the ground. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. Then he breathed into our nostrils the breath of life. And that term breath that was breathed in our nostrils was an invisible something. Amen. That was breathed into you and I. He breathed into our, you know, into, into, our, into our nostrils the breath of life. And then he says, and man became what? Man became a living soul. Ah, Felix, say this right. It's, it's, the word is nefesh in the Hebrew. And it's saying man became aware of himself. So when the spirit met the body, there was the emergence of the cognitive, you know, um, faculty, our thinking faculty, our awareness faculty. In fact, a lot of the time when you're talking about I, what you're referring to is really that the one that identifies as, as you is the region of your soul where your mind, your will, and your emotions reside. When you look at um, behavioral economics, what they did a long time ago is that they used to think people make rational decisions. Anybody that has studied economics, you know this. They used to think that people make rational decisions when they shop. And then they found out very quickly that no, they really don't engage their thinking. They engage the other part of their thinking mechanism, which is just below the cognitive, which you and I might, 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 might say the seat of the emotions. People usually do what they feel more than what they know to be right. So that's why you will know a person, you will meet a person that knows exactly what to do uh, to get in shape. They know it cognitively, but they don't feel like getting up and going to the gym. So their knowledge has no impact on their activity. When you, when you and I are in the kingdom of God, as leaders, part of what the Lord wants to do is it matters, let me just put it this way. It matters to God, not just what you think. It matters to God how you think. What does Paul say in the book of um, Romans chapter 12? You can turn there. Romans chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, you guys know the story, by the mercies of God. And I want to slow down here because I really want to emphasize this before we get too far. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you what? That you present your bodies as they live. Now, look at what it talks about, that you present your bodies. Okay, so this is your corporate reality, the tangible part of you, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is what he called your reasonable um, service. Others say your spiritual act of worship. He says, and do not be conformed to this world. And he says what? But be ye transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. So Paul says, do not be conformed, meaning don't be cut out of the, the you know, don't be a, a carbon copy of the world and the way it does what it does. But be, you know, be transformed. Oh, God, help me. How do you get transformed? By the renewing of your mind. What is one of the most vital things you can do as a leader to be the head and not the tail? Have to ask the quality of your thinking. More than just that, but we're going to also find out that one of the most important things that you, um, that you fine tune or that you, um, how you lead is from what you and I call the heart. When we talk about the heart, we're actually talking about the deep mind. Because the organ that pumps blood does not think, it doesn't contemplate, it doesn't do anything. All the contemplation is happening in the region of the mind, but there's a deep part of the mind that you and I identify as the heart. What is that place? Psychologists will say it's the unconscious mind, right? Uh, and so when you're looking at neurological structures, for some of you that may be familiar with this, is you know you got your 
prefrontal cortex, you've got the outer part where your cognitive functions, this, that sifting information takes place. There's a deeper part of your makeup. I'm talking from a biological standpoint where we're getting closer to the brain stem, where, you know, some will call it the ancient brain because they find that the same almost brain mechanism is familiar with other, you know, with even reptilia, with other animals, where, where that's the place of instinct. You, you came out of the womb, a child comes out of the womb, knowing how to suckle. And the child is born with two basic fears the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. Every other fear is learned from that point. So what is it? Is that there's a certain structure that there's a part of us, which is just a brain where our intelligence is, our smartness is, but there's a part where our instincts lie. It's the seedbed of our emotion. It's the deep brain. It's where we literally contemplate and make decisions. That's the place that is attached to sometimes referred to in the Bible as the region where the soul is our deep seed of emotions and contemplation so that when you are sad that's the part that is processing your sadness and so we understand that we made that question but here's why this is important for you to know because sometimes you know as christians people emphasize the heart as we should so i grew up in a church that everything we did as we felt i'm a black guy so let me tell you about the other you know the, the black church the black church is extremely emotional and that's why we call them soul brothers, right? When we're talking about black people, because that's why, you know, you know, people say that, oh, you know, African-Americans founded the blues because of their experience in slavery. No, the blues existed in the old country where we owned everything. It's just the way we are comported sometimes is that there's an emphasis on that part, which is emotion. So we have a powerful connection with God, but sometimes we then fail to develop the other part of our mind, which a leader must have. Because it's not enough just to have an affinity toward God. You've got to know how things work. You've got to study how things work. How do you grow a church? Well, my brother would just pray. No, I know prayerful churches that are 10 people for 20 years. You have to know certain things. Meaning you've got to apply yourself to learning. When it was time, to build the tabernacle of Moses, Exodus chapter 31. What did you see that the genius of the Holy Spirit, let me slow down here. The genius, I'm going all African and getting emotional with you guys, right? The genius of the Holy Spirit is this, is that the Holy Spirit is not only, is not only a genius at connecting us with God in what you might call the ecstatic connection with the Father. And I live on that. One of the first things I do as soon as I wake up is I kneel before the Lord. And sometimes I kneel long enough until I feel the touch. I really like to, to prepare a sermon unless I'm enraptured in his glory. I want to feel his presence, right? And all of that is beautiful and all of that is powerful. But here's what also must happen for you and I. And please, you know, take this for, you know, for, for, for what it's worth. What is also necessary for you and I is that we've got to become people that figure out how things work. I, the church I grew up in, we had a sign, and I think I mentioned this to you guys the last time, we had a sign on an empty piece of land. Here stands the, the property of the future or the future building of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Waterfalls. That sign was there since I was in the first grade. It was there in, during the second grade, before I was a Christian, because the church used to meet in my old kindergarten school. I left the United uh, Africa for the United States in 1998. The sign was still there. Was there a church? No. There was just a very old sign that spoke of a church being there one day. Why? Because people have this magical thinking that says, just because I prayed hard enough, you know, I'm just expecting things to manifest. No, you've got to become competent. You have to know how to manage things and how to administer. You know what I found out is the key to growing churches? Great administration. What is that? Great organizational skills. My pastor is probably one of the most powerful preachers I know, but our church was not growing. Right across town was an American guy called Pastor Tom Michelle. And his church was called Rayma. It's now called Celebration Center. If you can go and watch and look at Celebration Center in Zimbabwe, their auditorium and their running is bigger than most of the places that you see in Dallas. It, it, in one of the poorest countries on the planet, that's what Zimbabwe has become. So I asked Tom Michel a long time ago, I don't know if he even remembers this. Um, I said, Pastor Tom, you know, uh, how is it that you 
you guys are growing and we're not and we're powerful. Our worship, man, in my church, whoo, my God, we touched heaven. Church wasn't growing. Nothing was thriving. You know, we, we, we had no feeding, pro we had none of this. And then here's what Tom just told me. He says, Felix, I found out that one of the greatest gifts that the Lord can give is really a gift that touches on the cognitive, meaning he just teaches you how to run things. So as a young guy, he moved to Zimbabwe and he used to preach for scripture union, riding on his motorcycle, going from school to school. When he found out this, he dedicated himself to learning order, to learning structure, to learning how to put the right people in the right position and to learn how to motivate them. All of that is a skill that is learnable. We asked the question earlier, are leaders born or made? Every leader is born. Great leaders are made. Because whether you're... You, everybody already here is a leader, whether you have a position or not. The only question is if you're a good leader or a lousy one. Okay. Great leaders, if you look at the way the Lord dealt with all our great leaders, whether you want to look at Abraham, it appeared that he put them through a crucible of what you might call a process. In lack of a better, better term, it appeared to be a leadership school that lasted for years. So that the person that then stood in the position that was prescribed was not the same person that left the original position. Abraham leaving the Earl of Chaldees, moving into Palestine and blessing that territory in such a powerful way. David being a shepherd boy and then becoming the king of, 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 of Israel, Judah, then the king of Israel. And then one of the, you know, then bringing Israel to what is considered to this day is golden age. There was a process, it didn't happen overnight because there are certain things that he had to learn along the way. And all of that part of learning has got to do with engaging quality thinking. Luke chapter two, verse 40, and Luke chapter two, verse 52. And the child grew in wisdom and knowledge. What is that grow, growth? What is that a learning curve? Meaning what? Is that the quality of Christ's thinking when he was seven, was measurably different from the way he thought when he was 30. Why? Because he learned via a learning curve. What, is Paul, what did Paul say? He said, when I was, when I was a, a child, I thought as a child, I acted as a child, I, I, I thought as a child. But now that I've become a man, I'm what? I'm putting away childish things. Why are you saying that? My brother, my mind has grown. I've expanded my capacity to my, and my ability to think. Ladies and gentlemen, can I, can I be honest with you? You know, I, I dug into for, for a number of months, a few years ago, in, in, even fairly recently, just trying to understand thinking from a biological, neurobiological standpoint, not just from a psychological, but from the biology of thinking. And so, you know, I read Daniel Kahneman's work and his, his famous book is Thinking Fast and Slow. I listened to a bunch of his lectures and, 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 and Amongst other things, for lack of a better term, they say that the majority of people are very quick to come to conclusions about any body of information without vetting it and truly testing its plausibility. And you know what? I've lived long enough to, in the church to know that that is sometimes our problem. We are too quick with the amen before we get Dorian, which is what? I heard this information. I apply my thinking to it to see if it lines up with scripture. And now that it does, now I take it in. A lot of people have no filtering process. And I watch it with our politics. They say this, they say when you stand in, in, in the presence of a, of a charismatic man, because people sometimes wonder, how can a people as sophisticated as the Germans, you know, have a, a thug like, 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 like Adolf Hitler, literally rise up in one of the most sophisticated nations on the planet? and do the things that he did. Here's what they say, that when you're in the presence of a charismatic individual, that your cortical functions, the part of you that thinks and weighs information, oh, I don't know about whether, that, no, that part of you sh levels down, it, it shuts down. Then your limbic regions light up, which is the area of your emotion. And so you're not really hearing them, you're feeling them. And because you're feeling them, you're not vetting to see if what they're saying is true. And, and it, it's very important to learn how to think. They too few people thinking for the rest of us. And you want to be a leader? Why do, here's what they say. One in nine people decide for the other nine what they're going to do, where they're going to live, what they're going to wear, how they're going to trim their, their beard and their face, or they know what they're going to dress and what's in right now. One in nine make the decision for everybody else. Everybody else just jumps in and, and thinking. Why? Because thinking is hard. Have you ever worked? 
manual labor and you felt tired? Have you ever worked on a complex mental problem and you felt more tired than when you're pushing weights? Yeah, why? Because the thinking faculties consume a whole lot of blood glucose. Why do they do that? They do that, ladies and gentlemen, because thinking is not easy. And so what ends up happening is that for a lot of people, they allow other people to do their thinking for them. And because of that, they never really develop their mind. Here's what Paul says, right? He says, according to the, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 3, three verse 10, according to the grace that was given me as a wise master builder. According to the grace that the Lord gave me as a wise master builder. What does it mean that you're a wise master builder? A builder just does not expect God to move wonderfully. A builder knows how things work. What does a builder know? A builder knows what will stand and what will fall. The integrity of structures. That's why I said with Pastor Linson, you know, your background is engineering. You understand and appreciate what I'm trying to say. You can't just build a skyscraper just because you want to. Have you applied your thinking to find out how? What can enable this thing to stand? A lot of people just, they, they don't apply their mind to thinking because here's what they found out, that your cortical functions, your thinking functions, they, it consumes a whole lot, a major percentage of blood glucose. That's why you feel tired after you work on a math problem or after you work on some equation or after you, you, know, you do an economy, you feel tired because the thinking is like that. It's very taxing to blood glucose. So then what do you do? You abdicate that responsibility to somebody else or you recycle what those that have done before you. So you get one Mali, you know, Malayali church and you all enter one, you've entered them all, brother. You're, you've entered them all. Same type of thing because they're just like, what are they doing over there? Oh, that's what we're doing here. Are we okay? Think. It's not a sin to think. It's encouraged to think. Bertrand Russell said this, you know, atheist really um, if, uh, uh, philosopher, but he says this, some people would rather die than think. And I've seen that, it happens because thinking is not easy. You have to dedicate some time to really work through an issue, to really work through solutions, to not just trust what you feel because what you feel is a part of the thinking faculty, but it is not, you know, there's nothing ro wrong with rationality, being rational, being a person that can measure things is important to God. You know, there's something that the Lord said in the book of Zechariah that I always found shocking when I read it. It's in Zechariah chapter one. In around verse, let's go to, Zechariah chapter one, I'll start from around verse 18. Then I looked and I saw four horns so I asked the angel who was speaking with me, what are these? And he told me that these are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. And then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. And I said, Lord, what are these coming to do? He says, these are the horns that scattered Judah so that no one would raise their head. But the craftsmen have come to terrify them and throw, and throw down these horns of the nations that have lifted up their horns against the land of Judah to scatter it. You know, it always shocked me when I read this. Lord, I thought you were going to send soldiers. Why are you sending craftsmen? Oh. Because you can't fake being a craftsman. You have to know what you're doing. You can't, be, you can't fake being a carpenter. The coffee table will fall apart. You have to understand how, you know, joints work. You have to understand how, um, you know, how, how to plane and how you know, uh, to make sure that the, the wood is without knots. You have to be able to look at the integrity of the wood. You have to be able to know how it works. You have to know, you have to have a principle that what says what measure twice and cut once. Don't cut then measure. So what is it? It's a skill. And I, I want to emphasize on this because sometimes we over spiritualize everything. And so we have very, very prayerful churches that are not effective and very, very well-ordered churches that don't know how to pray. How about we have both? How about we have kings and priests, people that are very functional on the spiritual side and are absolutely, you know, walking in tremendous aptitude on the natural side. 
How much time do you invest in upgrading the quality of your thoughts? You know, in, in, in that book, I think you fast and slow, part of what they found out, these guys were just researchers. And uh, one of the, you know, I think um, Daniel Kahneman is a Nobel laureate. And here's what they found out. They found out that we think a certain number of thoughts a day, but uh, after the age of, what did they say? I think after the age of 24, 25, 80 to 90% of what people think after that age is not new information. It's just a recycling of whatever information that they, or, that they already had before. Meaning a lot of the times people stop learning. You know, why were you learning between age, the young age of 20 something? Because you had to, you have to be in school. Why? Because mom says you're going to school. So you had to learn. But the minute that you don't have somebody breathing down your neck, a lot of people just get lazy and they don't think anymore. Why am I saying this? I'm saying, listen, a lot of the solutions that are coming here, where are the wise individuals that people can go to that can solve problems, that can speak about, you know, about social issues in the nation? What is the, the problem in the United States right now? We're seeing it tear apart and come into division concerning racial issues. I have not seen a single you know, significant uh, figure stand up to proffer what might be even marginally a reasonable solution. Is there a solution? I believe there is. Where is that solution? Talking to me on Zoom on a cold day in Dallas for you guys. So then, oh God help me. Which time do I have? Oh my goodness. So then what, what do we do, Felix? What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to know that the Lord that helps us to speak in tongues also you know, sharpens the quality of our thinking. So we begin to understand how to build things that last. We begin to understand how to, to bring unity where there was division. We begin to understand how things work. It was craftsmen the Lord sent to go against what the enemy was doing. That means he, he, he allowed thinkers that learned their trade via an apprentice program that now knew how things work, how structures work. The Lord says, go and terrify the enemy because the enemy's attack, a lot of us think that the enemy's worst attack is the nightmares we have or this demonic, this or this demonic, that no. The enemy's real strategy is the systems he puts in place. What's hurting your city right now are the system the enemy puts in place. So if you don't have systematic thinking, how are you going to come against the system? Well, my brother, we're just going to sing very loud. Okay, now we sang, have the walls come down. No, we're going to go Jericho march around the city. I love that. I'm a prayer walker. But are the problems yet solved? No. We, somebody has got to say, Father, with the situations in my generation, here's my mind, Lord. Help me to think in a way that produces solutions. A lot of the times, whenever you propose a new way of doing things, you immediately get resistance. Do you know why there's usually resistance to suggestions of anything new? Because it requires people to think differently than what they were thinking before. They're not pushing against the idea. They're pushing against the work it takes to think. Have you ever been in that committee that I don't care what you suggest, the answer is always no. But you know, uh, you know, we, we know, we're thinking of doing this as the youth. No. Now, listen, I don't know any specifics, so don't go after the youth and saying, you know, they told, they haven't told me a thing. I don't know any specifics, just in case this is coincidental. But my whole point is this: usually, people that are just quick to say no, they are quick to say no because they don't want to apply the hard work of thinking. So they constantly think of why something should not be done, as opposed to looking at how it can be done. How it can be done—that's the function of the craftsman the people that have developed their know-how. So when we look at the quality of our mind, we're looking at the quality of our thinking in this particular way. I have the, the cognitive functions where my, intel, my, my intelligence and my, the intellectual part of me resides. It's important because God created it. It's not the be and all at all, no, but it's a vital part that also requires that I exercise it because, you know, the Bible has many, many scriptures. Just, just type in scriptures on thinking in, you know, in your Google and just read what, what those scriptures say. The entire function of thinking is what Solomon engaged in. They brought a problem to Solomon. Two women were, were claiming a child because one of them had smothered their child. So what does Solomon do? Solomon 
hears the situation and then contemplates. What is that he thinks? Was he No, there's nothing wrong with that. But in this instance, that's not what it's going to take. You have to think. So in thinking, an idea comes to him. And he says, oh, okay, listen, take that child, split the child in half. And immediately the child's mother says, no, no, it's okay. You don't have to kill that. The other woman is like, yeah, kill that child. And so Solomon says, that cannot be the mother. He was able to come to a conclusion because here's the thing. When he asked God for wisdom, God did not just give him supernatural wisdom. If you read what it says concerning Solomon, it says Solomon's wisdom, when the queen of Sheba came to him, it says Solomon's wisdom, the, the, the entire scope and the range of his wisdom is that he understood about the moss that grows between the rocks and about the cedars of Lebanon, about the big trees, meaning what? The most that grows, are the, you know, at that time, they were the smallest plants they could observe. And the cedars were the biggest plants they could, you know, observe. So he had taken the time to learn that entire scope of information from the smallest to the greatest. He did not enter into wisdom because he sat down and he just prayed about it. He entered into wisdom by studying. He applied his mind to knowledge and understanding. Are we okay? What they need on your job is a solution provider. What they need in the marketplace, so what they need in the city of, of Dallas right now is a solution provider. A person that can look at it, that does not give pet answers to complex problems. Christianese to really, really complex problems. It, I, Lord, may you raise a generation of Christian thinkers. Because that's exactly what, like right now, I'll give you an example. What's our plan for the next five years? Collectively as the church here in the United States. What's the big idea? What's the big plan? Oh, well, we'll just see what happens, brother. In the meantime, Mercedes-Benz already knows if they're working on the concept of one of their cars for 10 years from now. They're working on the concept as we speak. We have not even projected our mind beyond dinner. What's the plan? What's your life plan if I was to have this conversation with you? Hey, what do you see yourself in the next five years? Oh, whatever the Lord wants. That's a cop-out of a person that refuses to think. And then you think that you can hide behind the fact that it sounds spiritual. When the Lord said to Abraham, I shall produce a nation through you. I believe Abraham began to learn the language of kings. And that's why when he got to Palestine, he was speaking with almost at the same level with Abimelech, the king of Gerar. Why? He knew he had to be a statesman because he had, it had been revealed to him that his calling is to produce people that operate at a national level. Why was he praying for the cities of the plain of Sodom and Gomorrah? Because he already saw himself as God saw him. So he was already thinking at that frequency that I'm the type of intercessor that's praying for entire cities. Why? Because I'm a statesman. The Lord told me that out of me, nations shall be born. I, I need to challenge you right now. Do you know that one of the greatest conspiracies you know, that the devil has really put in place is just to distract us with so many other outlets that capture our thinking and capture our mind. The gadgets we have, the places we spend, the majority of your days probably spent on some social media platform if you're not careful. And, and, that, and not just that you're there to think. No, you are there to jump into somebody's train of thought. How much time do you dedicate? To come in before the Lord and say, Lord, touch my mind. Ooh. Are we okay? I'm almost done. I just do want to challenge you because you, listen, if you're going to want to lead, please be good at what you're about to do. Oh, I'm not good at it. Put in the time. I want you to just look at the difference between David and Saul. Just so you can see, I want you to understand how these men were comported. Why was God attracted to David? Because David possessed a learning curve. How do you know that David possessed a learning curve? 
He had two particular skills he knew how to do. He knew how to work a sling and he knew how to play a harp and lyre. What does that mean? You're not born with those type of skills. Those are skills you attain by applying yourself to learn something. From the neurological standpoint, what, what does that mean? It means you learn the, you know, the, the anatomy of that particular skill, and then you do what is called deep practice. What is deep practice? When you do it over and over and over again, perfectly, until literally in your neural pathways, myelin, you know, something's called myelin, hard wires your ability to do that thing because time was dedicated to learn a skill. Please, can any one of you tell me one thing that Saul was good at? One thing that he, he had mastery over, anything. There's no, David left how many writings? A shepherd boy. Saul couldn't even write one page, like one page of anything. No, but he loved being in power. He loved the exercise of power. But really, when you look at it, it was not a quality thinker, left nothing of substance on the earth except a story of a tragic biblical hero that started well and ended bad. When we fail to think, here's what happens. When you read 1 Samuel on, and this, this breaks my heart, guys, because I've seen this happen within the church. People that just don't know how to bring the best out of people. And okay, maybe you're the troubled childhood and maybe you grew up in a home that was bad, but you're not in that home anymore. You're a grown up person with your own house. Break away from those old habits and learn something new. Learn how to treat people better. Learn how to bring the best out of people. You don't just wake up with that ability. You apply yourself to that. So when I started preaching, here's what was, I used to stutter a lot. I still do every now and again. Do you know what I did? If you came into my car at that time, and I was driving a bit of old thing that I called a speed fire because it will go slow, then you will just hear this boom in the back, and you know, some smoke, and then it will take off, man. So I used to call it that, but if you went into that old thing, the cassette player that you would listen to is language tapes. Why? Because I knew I had to master English. Why? Because I'm going to speak in English. I can sing some of your guys' songs. Why? It didn't happen by magic. I don't apply myself to that. Why? Because I want to learn your culture if I'm going to be effective to you. And all of that takes time. It takes time. So none of that you're born with, you have to learn. And you have to learn by, because you value knowing and you value wisdom and you value understanding. You apply yourself to knowledge. So here's what David, he showed a proclivity to learning just by the fact that he picked up an instrument that he did not, he wasn't born with it. But he had such mastery that he was one of the best in the land. That when the king wanted to play somebody to come and play, they said, We know somebody who's really amazing at this. They said, Oh, so this kid not only knows how to look after sheep, not only knows how to protect them with a sling, not only knows that he can also play a harp and is also an amazing soldier. Well, because the anointing was on him. No, because he learned. The anointing came to fetch him. Because what? The Lord taught, here's what the Lord says to Samuel. Go into the house of Jesse. Why? Because I found in his heart, or rather in, in, in Jesse's family, David, a man after my own heart. Does it mean after God's beating heart? I told you that the heart is really the deep mind, the place of deep contemplation. This kid, the frequency of his thoughts, very similar to mine. Why? He protects the weak and so do I. I see that in him. Look at how he took care of that sheep. That's what I would do in that situation. I would go after that lion. And in fact, my son is going to go after the lion that has grabbed the lost sheep and he's going to break him just like David did. And that's what Christ did on Calvary. The Lord saw himself in that, in Jesus' boy, in the way he thought, the quality of his thinking. Watch what he does with broken people. Send him 400 of the book. Hey, which are the brokest guys we have? Send them to David. Let's see what he does that, with them. David figures out how to bring the best out of this mighty man. And then the Lord comes up and he says, I'm going to choose disciples. And he goes and chooses a ragtag army of the worst people. And what does he do with them? Changes the world. Why? He says, I see the pattern of thinking in this boy. And it's similar to mine. So one way or the other, in his seeking the Lord, in his loving God, David had not just had an experience with the father. He had run into the mind of the father. And he had allowed his thinking to be 
in the same light and the same frequency as the thinking of God. Are we okay? I'm challenging you. If you're working with children, yes, oh Felix, you know, I'm, I'm working with kids, figure out how to, how, how to move them. When I, when I, I, I did, um, uh, I did VBS or IBC Hebron in Houston, they had me speak to the little tykes. And you know, all I had to do, I remember the first job I had in ministry, Sunday school teacher. What did I learn from Sunday school? I learned that you have to be dynamic to hold the attention of, of toddlers because their attention span is like a, a second and a half. So you have to change the set quickly and you have to get them involved get them in, engaged. Thank God that that was part of the training ground. So that what I do right now is you to say, where, how deep do my roots run? Stuff I had to learn, man. I picked up Willie George books and find out how in the world do you work with kids? Boom, I had to learn it via learning curve. Today I can go and teach Sunday school. It doesn't bother me at all, I enjoy that. But I remember I used to petrify me like, how in the world am I going to speak to these little animals? And the, the Lord just says, you know, when you have a heart, you learn, you figure it out. Well, brother, that's not my gift. Yeah, that's a cop out of a person that won't apply themselves to learning. What do you mean it's not your gift? Whose gift is it to clean toilets? It's nobody's gift, but somebody just does it because it has to be done. There are certain things that are done just because I will learn how to do it well because it has to be done. Are we okay? I know my time is probably up. Pastor Linson is like, dude, dude, can you? How, how am I doing on time, Pastor Linson? You're uh, two minutes over. Two minutes over. Okay, I'm going to take another five minutes and I should wrap it, wrap it down. <laughs> hey, you invite me once a year, you're going to get it all. So what, what, what is my encouragement? My encouragement for you and I is that the quality of our thinking If you want to know how, when you read Psalm 119, and there's evidence that maybe David wrote it, even though there was no name of the writer of that, of that particular long psalm, but there's evidence that it could have been David. And amongst part of the reasons why people say that is the Vedic theology is kind of seen in it. So there's sometimes this thing that yeah, maybe it was David that was in there, but all you see is a person that is applying their mind to not just learn the word of God, but what is the word that is repeated time and time again? Your precepts. What are the precepts? It's the underlying philosophy behind what you do. I want to know your precepts. Meaning, I just don't want to know what you do. I want to know why are you doing it that way? What is that? It's the person who's applying themselves to deep understanding. He says, oh, I cannot wait for the day to break because at that time they didn't have electricity, right? Oh, I cannot wait for the day to break so I can, I can be back in the word of God. So every single one of the 150 verses, 172 verses rather, that make up Psalm 119, all of them speak about a man who's applying his mind to not just know the word of God. It's easy to memorize scripture, but it's to understand the principles that undergird those scriptures. Because the principles that undergird those scriptures are the very same principles that hold the fabric of creation together. What must leaders do? Don't lead me if you're not going to upgrade your thinking. Because I want to upgrade mine. And I don't want to end up just working under somebody that refuses to think. And I have to do all your thinking for you. So if you're going to lead me, lead me on that path. Let me know that you're studying. Let me know that you're expanding. Whatever. Listen, you don't have to be brilliant at everything. But in that area where the Lord has entrusted you, go for mastery. Go and just be the best you can be in that field. It's important. Why? How do we do that? It's because here's what leaders do. If you think at the same frequency as the people that, you know, that are supposed to follow you, then really what, what qualifies you to lead them? Are you just a leader by the draw, you know, the, 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 the pick of a draw? Or are you a leader because there's something about the way you think that you edge yourself ahead of the pack so that you can set a, a, a pace and a tone of quality thinking. So how do you do what you do now? Christ said to his disciples, follow me. So he then exemplified a different way of thinking. That's why the Bible begins, you know, the ministry of John the Baptist and the ministry of Christ begins by these two words. I'm closing my Bible so I don't get carried away. I'm, I'm done for the night. Repent. What does repent mean? Change the way you think. For the kingdom of heaven. It's metanoia in Greek. Oh, I thought repentance was asking God to forgive me. That's confession. 
And that's asking for forgiveness. It's not repentance. Metanoia is a Greek concept. It's very deep. It has got to do with re reshuffling the way you think. Why did it say change the way you think? He says, because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why should I think the, the, the way I think because the kingdom is at hand? It is a radical way of thinking. It is filled with what you and I call possibility thinking. How do you get 12 people who are ma mainly unlearned and one of them falls and you only train them for three and a half years and then you tell them, okay, guys, cut. What, we're breaking the huddle. What are you gonna do? You're gonna go change the world. How did they have to think there was a radical shift in thinking? Most of those men had never traveled more than 50 miles outside of the city of their birth. And now all of a sudden they're being sent to the ends of the earth. What, what happened when you went with Christ? Your heart just didn't change, your thinking changed. What type of a person are you? Are you what I call the genius of forecasting worst case scenarios? You know that type of person? The minute that you, you say any idea, they're like, oh, brother, COVID, COVID, brother. Huh? How are we going to do that COVID? During this time of COVID, look at what happened with the Robin Hood stock, <laughs> with, with, with GameStop. Other people were making ideas, making moves, man. And other people were parked there just waiting for the, for the storm to be over. Here's what happens in any circumstance, the thinkers, It says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Can I tell you what that actually means? Meek does not mean all oh, the lowly on heart. No, meek means those that are strength under control. What is strength under control? It's discipline. What is discipline? So it's what, what, what does discipline, uh, how is discipline so powerful? Because it means you're going to have to do extra work when everybody else is sleeping. You crack and open that book to learn a little bit more. So that when you talk to your Sunday school kids, you give them something of value. Well, something my pastor told me is that never lay a sloppy meal for God's people. If you're going to give them something, give them the best that you can. Whether they're five-year-olds or the 50-year-olds. If that's your posture, guess what? You are that student who's constantly learning. And guess what you are now? You're a disciple. What is a disciple? He's a student. When do you graduate? When we all get to heaven. Until then, you got to learn, man. Are we okay? I want to pray over you because we are in a new season that is going to require upgraded ways of thinking. Maybe that, let me use that word. May the Lord give you the courage because another part of thinking when we talk about the mind is the heart is part of the mind, which is the, the deeper mind. And whenever you talk about the heart, resident in the heart is something that we call courage. And courage is a fortitude of the mind to do what needs to be done in spite of backlash. A lot of people have weak minds because the moment they think they might get persecuted for something, they hold back and don't do it. That's why people don't stand up and get themselves counted. Or what people? What if people laugh at me? I'm praying that your mind may be so steeled, your, your mind may be so tempered and so fortified in God that you do take the risk, that you do step out, that you do offer solutions. What if they laugh at me? What if it helps? What if it actually measurably changes the way things are for your workplace, for your group, for your city, for your church? May the Lord raise leaders that are not lazy to think. Why am I using the word lazy as I'm talking about thinking? Because one of the reasons why we don't think is just pure laziness. And then what we begin to do is we begin to procrastinate. Please let me say this, Pastor Linson, then I'm going to hand back to you. What is procrastination? Do you know that procrastination has probably robbed many of us of some great things that God could have done to us? How does that do? The biology of procrastination is this, is that the Lord has hardwired your system through the dopamine serotonin loop. Here's what happens. Whenever you make a quality decision, your body rewards you with a feel-good home, you know, um, um, chemicals, dopamine serotonin. So, so here's what you do. When you're stressed about what you have to do, you've got one or two choices. That's why a lot of you are waiting to launch on some great ministry someday. You haven't done it because, again, it's actually resident in the weakness of thinking, which today I hope you can fortify yourself to make the right decision at the right time. The way it works is like this. It's like, I have a decision to make. I have got to do this right now, but I'm stressed about it. Oh, but here's what I'll do. I'll do it this time next week. So the minute that you make a quality decision, your system says, well done, you've made a decision. 
So what happens? The stress rises up next week when you're about to do it. And you're like, oh, really? I've got to do this. I'm stressed about this. But you know what? I'm going to do this this time next week. And your body says, oh, you made a decision. Every time you make a quality decision, your body rewards you. And so before you know it, a year has gone by. And the thing we said we're going to do has not yet been done. It affects all of us. What am I asking of us as we depart tonight? I want to pray for you, if you don't mind. I want to pray that the things that the Lord has embedded in your heart and the things that he's called you to do, the visions that he's given you, it's going to take courage. It's going to take breaking the spirit of laziness in thinking because a lot of those things have to be planned. So while the spirit of God is there with you, you still have to do the practical work of writing it down and of figuring out how it can be done. That's an entire process that's going to be taxing to you. But I pray that the fact that it's hard does not give you an excuse to not do it. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your people. And I thank you, Father, for this moment that we can spend in your presence. And Father, I'm just asking for all of us that we want to lead. But Father, may you touch our mind. And Father, may, may you make it okay for us to think. Sanctify thoughts. God ordained thoughts. I pray, Father, for the anointing that was on Daniel to provide national solution. I pray, Father, for the anointing that was on Joseph to provide economic solutions. I pray right now, Father, for the anointing that was on Bezalel, the anointing of craftsmanship, of building things that last, that are beautiful, that, that, that are excellent. May that anointing be upon our people and may they touch our mind even now so that what we produce in the journey that we're on right now as Metro Church, as the children of God, as whichever ministries that are represented here, that what we produce may, be, may glorify you because of the touch of excellence that it has. Father, we commit our thinking to you. We, we want to love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind. Help us to learn how to love you with our mind, how to love you with the quality of our thinking. Holy Spirit, you are the spirit of wisdom. Touch every mind even now. Energize every mind toward a solution orientation. To, and may you be glorified in that in the days of our life, Lord, you will enable us to reveal the genius of God based on the quality of our thinking. We dedicate our entire thinking faculty to you today. In the mighty name of Jesus. Yes, you in the name of God bless you. Thank you. <laughs>